Welcome to the Design Considerations and Best Practices Bootcamp for the Business Process Desktop Solution. My name is Muthu Samusundaram and I work on the Solutions Management team within the End User Computing Business Unit at VMware. In today's session, I'm going to give you an overview of the solution and walk you through the various design elements that you should be aware of during the solution design process. We will cover design considerations for Active Directory setup, network, security, backup and restore configurations, and finally spend a few minutes on view and vSphere best practices to round out the session. I have added a couple of links at the end of the session which point to a lot of excellent resources, and I encourage you to go through them before and during your design phase. With that being said, let's jump to the solution overview section. The business process desktop solution is primarily aimed at the contact center use case. It is designed for task-based workers accessing your desktops and applications from within the internal HQ network and from the third-party site over the van. A quick disclaimer before, you, before we move on, uh, you should take the solution, design considerations, and best practices discussed here with a pinch of salt. Real-world scenarios are usually very unique, so use this design as a recipe and feel free to add components, swap out components, or remove some of the elements that may not be a good fit for your environment. The idea behind us doing this in our labs is to prove the interoperability of all the components, validate the solution end-to-end, -end, and confidently give you the recipe to build your own design. So going back to the solution, this primarily deals with the task-based workers and contact center use case. The same model is also used for the power user use case, which caters to developers working from off-site or offshore locations. For this solution, we focused on delivering four key features. Designing a secure environment, which meets the various compliance requirements of various verticals. Since this design involves multiple sites, we added components which will provide centralized management for the admin. Provide backup and recovery to provide HA and reduce the amount of downtime, since in many cases, downtime has a direct impact on the customer's revenue. And finally, scale on demand. A typical contact center environment might have seasonal requirements. We added elements which will help in easily scaling up or down as per the customer requirements. Jumping into the architecture, I'm going to walk you through the various elements of the solution as we built it in the lab. Again, feel free to add or remove any components for your design as you see fit. To start off with, the desktop session is initiated by the user. The request is first met by the load balancer at the edge of the network. We'll cover the load balancer configuration in more detail further into the session, but to give you a quick overview, the load balancer looks at the source IP, user ID and password, and forwards it to the right site, either the corporate HQ, co-location center, or the third-party site. The next step in the process is the view security server, which resides in the DMZ. This provides a layer of security for connections, which come in from outside the network. Each security server is paired to a view connection server. Depending on your environment and your security requirements, you might need to have one pair of security servers and connection managers, two, or maybe none. If you want to have a standard security server set for external connections from re regular employees, one for contractors with, say, radius integration, you can do that. Or if you do not expect any external connections at all, you can have the sessions directly terminate into one of the connection managers. From a best practices standpoint, it is recommended to have more than one connection manager to provide high availability. Also, as always, if you're going, to, if you're going for high availability, make sure the connection manager VMs fall, follow the anti-affinity and other such rules. Under the view connection managers, we have a set of infrastructure VMs. The first one is the Active Directory VM. In our lab design, we use the new Active Directory setup. In your environment, you might already have an AD. You can choose to use the same AD or create a child domain based on the security and other requirements. Next up is the Certificate Authority. Again, most customer environments might already have a CA installed in their environment. In our validation, we deployed a Microsoft Certificate Authority. We also have a RADIUS server in the environment. This is to provide additional security for connections from external network, that is, people working from home, etc. You can pair the RADIUS server with a security server to provide that additional layer of security. If you do not anticipate any outside connections, you can ignore this component. Uh, if you want one, there are a lot of vendors who provide RADIUS servers now, like RSA, SafeNet, etc. 
and for our design we use a Microsoft Radius server. The validated design guide that we published for this solution has detailed instructions on configuring the Radius server. Do check it out. The link to that doc is provided at, at the end of the session. We have some regular file and print services, backup, which is pretty standard in any environment. We also have a vCenter VM to manage the environment. From a monitoring perspective, we added vCOPS for view in our design. vCOPS is usually tied to a vCenter, so we deployed one at each site for monitoring. In addition to that, to provide security and compliance, we added the vShield suite of products, the app, edge, and endpoint to the design. VShield App and Edge provide superior security to the environment, and VShield Endpoint provides hypervisor-based antivirus, which is be very beneficial in terms of desktop VM resources. Obviously, there are a couple of SQL DB VMs to support vCenter, vShield, etc. Under the management layer, we have the virtual desktops. In our design, we use stateless desktops on SST. We have reference architectures built for the various deployment scenarios and you can choose one, any one of them to meet your requirements. The management and virtual desktops are usually separated into different clusters for scalability purposes. So the same design that you're seeing here is replicated at the two other sites also, the corporate co-location center and the third party site. Since the corporate co-location center is a geographically separate uh, center, and since the third party site has different security requirements, because of, say, contractor access, etc., we replicated the design in three sites instead of extending any one site out to cater to the needs of the other site. This will ensure that all the users and all the sites have a superior user experience. From an image consistency standpoint, the images are maintained in the corporate HQ site and pushed out to the other two sites. All the sites have backup software to backup the management VMs. At the two sites, the corporate co-location and the third-party site. In addition to backing up the management VMs, we also backed up the profiles and corporate data to the Corp HQ site. We will cover more about that on the future slides, but backing up critical data like profiles, etc., ensures that in, a, in case of a site failure, we can seamlessly alter the networking to continue the business functions. So that's the architecture overview. And before we dive in deep, some top-level items to consider. These are pretty standard items that we cover for all the solutions, but to quickly recap. Active Directory. Like I said earlier, before the design, make a note of the Active Directory configuration at the customer site and understand the requirements of the user's location and their application access requirements. From a network standpoint, document the current network infrastructure, IPs required, VLANs required for the architecture, and the workload that will be generated across VAN. Understanding and making sure that the network infrastructure can handle the load or if need be, upgrading it beforehand will make the design and architecture go smoothly. From a security and compliance standpoint, uh, it is key to understand and document the security requirements of various groups of users. Since the users will be based in different locations, understanding this will give us the opportunity to right-size the security for various users within the environment. We should also understand the company's backup and restore policy and also the high availability and backup requirements of the users. This will determine the load balancer, network, and server sizing at the three sites. From an application workload standpoint, it is better to document the various applications that will be used and the potential load on your network. This will help us determine the WAN bandwidth and also potentially look at thin apping some of the applications. And last but not least, it is important to understand the scale requirements beforehand so we can size the environment appropriately. With all those said, let's dive right into the Active Directory considerations. In this design, we are looking at three distinct sites, the Corp Headquarters, the Corp Co-location Center, and the Third Party Data Center. It is important to understand any existing AD infrastructure in the environment. In this design, the Corp environment and the Corp co-location center can be in the same domain, but due to the increased security requirements, it is recommended to create a child domain for the third-party data center. Also, in this design, we'll be introducing a bunch of new elements into the AD, and it is better to make sure that if the DC will have enough resources to cater to the increased demand. It is important to understand the HA and business continuity requirements also, since 
appropriate entitlements have to be done in the 80s. We will cover a bit more on, on that in the next slide. Also, make sure the CA requirements for the design are documented and if it can be catered to by the existing CA or if a new CA has to be created. From a networking standpoint, it is critical that we configure the load balancers to ensure that the right traffic is sent to the appropriate site. In our design, we have the global traffic manager and a local policy manager in each site. The session is initially terminated into the global traffic manager. The GTM looks at the source IP or the user ID and forwards it to the right site, which is pre-configured in the GTM. Once the session request is received at the site, the load balancer looks at the Active Directory in that site and determines that the user is entitled to use the resources there. If so, it forwards the request to the connection manager. If not, the request is sent to the next site. The same process is repeated until the session finds a home. This is where it is important to coordinate the networking and ED entitlements. If we want high availability, if one of the site goes down, if the user has to be transferred to another site for an open desktop, we need to make sure that the user or users who need HA are entitled in all the sites where they can go. The GTM plays a very important role here since if a user is entitled in all the sites, it is important to forward the initial request to the correct site to start off with to ensure good user experience, etc. For that, the GTM has to be configured to look at either the source IP or the user ID and then, the, and then send the request to the primary site that the user should go to. Based on the required functionality, it is important to pick the right load balancer for your design. Also, each load balancer might need a separate VLAN for proper functioning. Based on the customer environment, understand the load balancer VLAN requirements, like one for internal traffic, one for HA traffic, etc., and configure them appropriately. All right, going into security. We deployed the VShield suite of products to ensure that the solution is secure and meets the various compliance requirements. VShield app and edge products provide a logical grouping of the various VMs. In our design, we have multiple pools and we also have a pool of line of business and management VMs. With VShield app, we can create these logical boundaries within, which ensures that the traffic flow is regulated between these sets of VMs. So the desktop VMs talk to the line of business, application v, uh, line of business applications, but not each other. In addition to that, with the latest VShield 5.1 suite, we have a compliance component attached to it. W what it does is, it provides a DLP light type of service, which ensures that the data is protected within the environment. If you're designing this for a telesales contact center, uh, you can configure it to ensure that the credit card info cannot be copied, etc. This will ensure that the environment is compliant to any regulatory requirements. Again, ensure that all the compliance requirements are documented before the design and make sure that the products are configured appropriately to meet all those requirements. The configuration options usually are very granular inside VShield. From a best practices standpoint, ensure that all the users and their applications and their application access requirements are documented so you open up the right channels to make sure that the users will be able to access those applications. In addition to that, make sure you open all the required ports for view to function properly. Refer to the view design guide for those requirements. VShield Suite also includes VShield Endpoint, which is a hypervisor-based antivirus solution. Using a hypervisor-based antivirus solution really helps the desktop sizing, since some of the memory and CPU requirements of a typical AV scan is now offloaded. But the AV products will have some impact on the overall host so make sure that the sizing impact of adding a hypervisor-based AV solution is taken into account. And it is important that the VShield suite of products are deployed on the host during the onboard process. This is critical because once it is onboarded, you cannot uh, deploy them again. So make sure that they are deployed during the onboard process. And finally, expect to run into some issues during the deployment of this and learn how to troubleshoot. That always comes in handy. Okay. Moving on to the backup and restore piece. In our design, we backed up the images, management VMs, and profile data at each site. In addition to that, the images are pushed out from the COP HQ to the other two sites to ensure image consistency. 
The user profile and CARP data information was also backed up to the CARP HQ site from the other two sites. This is done to make sure that if any one of the sites are down, it can be brought back up at the earliest. And also to make sure that to ensure business continuity, if required, the users from the other two sites can be entitled to the CARP HQ site. So if their site goes down, their connections can be routed to the CARP HQ where they can use a standby desktop till their site comes back up. If HA is required, you need to ensure that Active Directory entitlements, view connection manager entitlements are taken care of for the users who might need to work out of another site. Also, you need to make sure that the environment is sized appropriately. And because there is going to be an influx of new connections, that there is enough IPs available to cater to all those users. All very standard info, but nevertheless, good to know and document them so in case of a disaster, we'll have things prepared. Okay, let's move on to the final section, which is the view and vSphere considerations. Let's start with the Windows VM. In our design, we stored the master image in the data store, uh, in an SSD data store, and uh, the replica is stored on a local or SSD data store. We used SSD in our architecture, but feel free to use any that you see fit for your environment. Again, refer to our RE documents to see the best practices for the various storage options. The thin apps are hosted on ADDFS network shares at each side and were streamed to the desktop. Again, your environment's application workload will determine if you want to do this or if you want to go the traditional route of deploying applications in the master image directly. From a persona standpoint, uh, we stored the data on SMB network shares. We will look at persona a bit more on the next slide. When you're using persona, make sure you understand the density and scale considerations. The CPU cycles required for Persona should be taken into account when you're designing your environment. Experiment a bit with the profile upload intervals and pick the right one that suits your environment. Also, when possible, use Persona and not Windows roaming profiles. This will ensure that there is no conflict in the system. And make sure you look into and spend some time on application-specific requirements such as the NAP sandbox roaming, etc. And finally, determine how adding Persona will affect your antivirus strategy. If you're using a hypervisor-based AV solution, like how we did in our design, there are two options. You can have the AV scan the Persona folder during the VM scan, or you can scan the Persona piece directly. Look at the options, understand the resource requirements, and pick the right one for your design. And finally, some general view and vSphere guidelines. We encourage you to leverage VDS wherever possible in your design. Uh, we used it extensively in our environment and it definitely has a lot of flexibility to any design. Some high-level useful features of vSphere use auto-deploy and host profiles for rollout and ongoing compliance. This will ensure conformity at scale and also simplify your task a lot while onboarding new hosts when scaling up at any site. Wherever possible, use vShield Edge for DHCP load balancing, etc. It's a pretty awesome solution and it seamlessly integrates into the design. And finally, from a scale perspective, it is preferable to go with a separate view composer VM instead of it being a service in the vCenter. It'll help you scale up easily. And that's all I have. There are going to be a lot more boot camps specifically dealing, delving deep into each one of the sections that we covered uh, in this session. Please go through them at your convenience. They are going to be in the same site, so log back in every day and check them out. Uh, and below are some other links where you will find uh, some very useful information on both the business process desktop solution in particular and view in general. Thank you very much.